Welcome back to another episode of the TMC Talk Show. This time we are sitting down with former F1 driver and Le Mans winner, Mark Blundell. In this episode, Mark and I discuss the current state of F1, driving for McLaren, and that one time Mark stole Martin Brundle's first class airline seat. Keep watching to hear all of Mark's tremendous stories from his time in the world of motorsport. Welcome back everyone. I think that today is just about the best Wednesday afternoon that I've ever had in my life because in a few short seconds I'm about to interview a former Formula One driver. All of that is to say, Mark, that I'm really excited for our conversation today. So to get it rolling, I'd like to start at the very beginning of your career. Most single-seater drivers and drivers that I've gotten a chance to interview have all gotten their starts in karting, but you started in motocross. Why exactly did you start there? Uh, it's a very good question. Um, I think actually probably because where I was living, which is quite rural, uh, and at the same time, it seemed to be uh, the in sport in the school where I was. Uh, a few of the guys had dirt bikes and uh, it was a, a fascination to me to jump on a bike and, you know, get a little bit of speed and a bit of uh, excitement under my uh, backside. So, it, it kind of just was a very organic process. We, uh, we got into motocross, um, didn't start that until quite late, so like 14 years old. Um, and being really honest with you, didn't have an understanding about karting and didn't really understand about motorsport per se, um, other than Formula One that I would watch on TV as a kid. So, um, yeah, two wheels was the first sport. Still passionate about it. Still got a motocross bike. Still love watching it, especially Supercross in the USA. Um, and also been very thankful to meet a couple of those guys as well because in my eyes they are superstars. All right. Well, after after starting the motocross, you then progressed through Formula Ford and Formula Three Thousand, and you eventually moved on to sports cars with Nissan. Uh, with Nissan in 1990, you then became the youngest driver ever to sit on pole at Le Mans. Uh, still being a relatively unknown or untested driver at this point in your career, how important was that Le Mans result in terms of getting noticed and maybe moving your career forward? Uh, well, I guess actually my career was quite uh, rapid in terms of ascent because, as you say, I only started racing in 1984. And by 1989, I was already testing a Formula One car. So, you know, back then it was a very quick transition. Um, in today's world, maybe it wouldn't be looked upon in that way. But uh, Formula Ford was a fantastic ground in terms of testing out your abilities and your awareness of others around you on track because it was a very busy racing period with some great names attached to it. Uh, the likes of Damon Hill, Johnny Herbert, Eddie Irvine, uh, Bertrand Gasho, all guys actually that competed against each other at a young age and all made it to Formula One. Um, but we all took very different paths. <clears throat> so you've outlined about F3000. I was probably one of the only guys on the block that jumped from Formula Four 2000 directly to F3000. Uh, hadn't really been done before. So that was something that uh, got me noticed. Um, but you're right also that I went to sports cars and world sports cars back then was pretty much in its prime. So to be contracted to, uh, to Nissan Motor Company as one of the factory drivers was a big thing for me as a young guy. And to be in a situation where I put the car on pole position at Le Mans by, I think even today, the biggest margin ever. I think we were on pole by over six seconds. And I'm pretty sure that stands as a record uh, as we are today. Uh, was an achievement and an achievement actually in driving that car in particular because it had over a thousand horsepower and uh, and it's a well-known story in motorsport now that actually it never ran cleanly until we did that one lap and that was the only lap that engine ever did at full power before it was taken apart and um, to this day I still have one of the pistons from that engine sitting on my desk. Nice. Well, I, I was hearing, didn't you actually, or you, you kind of think that you might have been able to put it on pole by even more than six seconds had a few other things played out better for you on that lap? Most definitely. Uh, very confident it would have been the case because even uh, the story is that actually the, the car never ran all, all week long cleanly. And I kept having to abort the laps and was told over the radio to uh, bring the car back into the pit lane. And actually with this lap that I was on, I uh, took the decision upon myself to not do that 
because a car was over boosting with the turbos and the team told me to come back in the pit lane and I uh, took out the radio plug so I didn't have no further communication with the team and uh, proceeded to put myself in a position of actually going to do a lap which was going to make me a hero or make me zero because I would have been fired when I got back to the, uh, the pit lane. Lucky for me, it made me a hero because I put the car on pole. But we did it with such a, uh, such a uh, tyre combination. It was actually the hardest tyre that we had available. The reason for that is because we had no reference and no data with the car running with soft tyres on to know whether they would last a lap. So the safest bet was us to put hard tyres on. So if we'd have had qualifying tyres or a soft race rubber, I'm pretty sure we would have done even uh, quicker. And also if I'd have had knowledge of the car in that configuration, because the lap that I did, which I think you can still see on YouTube, was the first time ever that I experienced the amount of horsepower that the car produced. And, you know, when I turned up at the first chicane on the Mulsanne at 238 miles an hour, everything was exactly that. It was a reactive lap experiencing it for the first time as you saw it as well as me. Interesting. Well, and I want to talk a little bit about your time testing for Williams because that was kind of going on at the same time. Um, well, first of all, kind of help us set the scene. The, the 90s are often considered this golden era for technology in F1, but why is this and what role did you have in that? So I was probably the first generation of test driver in F1 where you, uh, where you actually held a contract and was, uh, you know, on a very big test program, did several thousand kilometers of testing with Williams, um, a huge amount more than what today's test driver or, you know, reserve drivers would do because it's very limited opportunity. But it was exactly that. It was a test driving role that was fundamental and functional for the team, um, mainly also with a test team. So a completely independent operating Formula One team in its test configuration alongside the race guys. So I was lucky that I went to Williams um, and was involved in a lot of the technology and projects around then, mainly active ride suspension. And I would say I've probably done more miles, more kilometers in an active ride Formula One car than any other driver there is. Uh, and also I did most of the work with semi-automatic gearboxes, so paddle shift, um, most of that stuff was done with me uh, at, the, at the wheel of a Williams as well. So, you know, very fortunate, very lucky to have done all that. Very fortunate to work with some great guys. Uh, you know, back when I was doing that, there was a guy called Paddy Lowe, Patrick Lowe, yeah. who then went on to be one of the superstar designers and technical guys in Formula One. Uh, but back when I was test driver at a young age, I think it was some 21 years old or so, you know, Paddy was uh, a young engineer as well. And, uh, I don't think he had any heady heights of being where he ended up in the Formula One pit lane, the same as me as a Grand Prix driver. Yeah, well, Patty Lowe, that's certainly a name that I know. Um, I just want to go back a little bit. You're talking very briefly. You mentioned how you do a lot, like way more miles back then you did than what test drivers do now. So would are test drivers still like an asset to an F1 team today, or is that just kind of you know, an add-on or an afterthought? That's a good question. Um, I don't believe that they have quite the same functionality is what they did back then and i say that because you know very often the case would be that we would be testing parts and developing the car while the grand prix guys were on the road and you know it'd be nothing for us to go out and test at silverstone and be running around with a new wing new underfloor um, new suspension configuration testing fuels engine developments and from our data and our you know development and our understanding of what the car was doing in terms of its performance, we would then be able to send out those parts onto the Grand Prix team and they would fit them ready for that weekend for the Grand Prix drivers to use. So, you know, very much a case of being hands-on. Today's world has been taken over slightly with technology, you know, CFD and tunnel work and a lot of computer uh, generated, um, you know, strategies that are used and, and performance uh, baselines. But from that, I think, you know, the simulator role has taken on its its own guys, but I still don't think that the simulator role gives a race team all of the insights into the uh, the workings of a driver. And, you know, a racing driver is, is not just about driving a race car. He's about being the motivating force, a politician, a CEO, you know, the finance director. He's really got to be able to pull that team around him and support all of the other channels as well. So... 
Yeah, I, I think teams today miss out on test driver roles. I really do. I think it's something that should come back. And I think it also should come back because it will give teams more understanding and education on who their drivers are for the future and when they're ready to put into their car and get the job done. Because it's, you know, you're looking at Formula One now where some drivers have been around for, you know, 15, 16, 17, 18 years. And, you know, I think there should be a, a natural process of the next generation coming through and making it a little bit more consistent. And not to say I want to see those guys. I still love watching a Kimi Raikkonen. <laughs> and I still like to see, you know, uh, the characters in the sport. But I think it's good to get young blood in as well. No, that's, that's actually a very interesting point. And it's definitely, I think, characteristic. It, it makes sense considering your background, right? Because I feel a lot of people would make the argument that, you know, with things with CFDs, SIMs, stuff like that, it cut costs, you know, makes racing maybe overall makes Formula One a bit more enticing for anyone who wants to enter the sport. Yeah, but I would argue with you that costs don't get cut at that point because F1 is uh, the pinnacle of motorsport. And, you know, without doubt, they just apply the funding into other areas to try and take advantage. So, you know, the days of a simulator program being run by one guy and a laptop are long gone. You probably take 10 people now to operate an F1 sim and all of the resource and the remote group of guys and girls that are working alongside a Grand Prix weekend with all of that data being, uh, you know, shipped between the destination of the Grand Prix and back to base. Um, you know, so... I think, you know, it's not just about a Grand Prix driver. It's about all of the other people and, uh, you know, the fundamental workings of mechanics working on the car, engineers working in a test environment, again, being taken then into the race program with hands-on experience. You know, that's a little bit of the issue today. Sometimes no different to young racing drivers. You know, they, they've cut their teeth on, on simulators before they even get into a race car. And, and uh, although there's some relevance, it's not completely the same. You know, I've never known anybody to have an accident in a simulator where they've got broken bones. And I've never seen anybody in a simulator go into a corner with somebody wheel to wheel at 200 miles an hour and come out the other side. You know, it doesn't happen. You know, yes, it, it is on a screen, but that's not quite the same as being on track. Yeah, I definitely agree with you there. Well, just to pivot a little bit, and you'll probably roll your eyes that, at the fact that, you know, yet another interviewer is bringing this up with you, but I feel I have to ask. So why did you leave the Williams test seat in 1991 and effectively give your buddy Damon Hill a path to win the world championship? Uh, yeah, well, hindsight's a wonderful thing, isn't it? So, uh, and if I had a crystal ball, I'd have used it without doubt. I, it, very easy. At the end of the day, I was a young guy who'd got the opportunity with Williams and I was holding a, a long-term contract. But in some ways, I was a victim of my own success because I'd done such a good job with Williams in testing. And again, because of doing all of those miles and because all the other teams were there testing alongside, you had lots of opportunity to show your performance and your ability, and you had lots of other teams looking at you to see that you were the real deal. And at that point, the Brabham team had been watching my performances, seeing my development role, and offered me a Grand Prix seat. Little did I know that actually it wasn't the right decision for me to take. But when you're a young guy with limited amount of guidance around you, being offered a Formula One seat and being paid as a professional racing driver, you know, you open your arms up and you take the opportunity. I should have had the foresight and the vision and the people around me to say, no, stay at Williams, because that really is where you're destined to continue being a Grand Prix driver. And I think the opportunity could have still been there for me to do so. But I took the, the first golden opportunity that was presented to me, and I, and I ran with it. And uh, yeah, in hindsight, it wasn't the right decision. And I look back now, and you know, luckily, it went to a very good friend of mine with Damon, my good buddies. And in fact, it was me that you know, informed Damon and telephoned him to say, you need to get your backside down to Williams because I've just left as test driver and there's a vacant seat there, which he did. Um, but he went on and did one better. He went and won the world championship with them. So, uh, you know, maybe some of my work helped him out to go and do that previously, but he won't admit that. Yeah, I'm sure it does. Well, so as you're saying, in 1991, you ended up racing for Brabham in a subpar car, and you really weren't able to score points. But then in 1992, you decided to sign a testing contract with McLaren. 
So why did you opt out or opt for a testing contract instead of a seat somewhere else where you could actually be competing? Uh, pretty much because of the reasons what I just said. You know, having made that decision, I I knew very quickly that it was the wrong one um, because the performance of the car wasn't there. And you know what underlined that to me is in the 1991 season, I was asked by Williams to return and go back and test their car for them, which was unheard of. You know, you very rarely get a Grand Prix driver being contracted to one team and being asked by another team to go back and test their car. Um, I jumped at the chance. Brabham were very happy to do it because they felt that it would have been good for them to have some insight into the latest, you know, FW14B Williams, which is a Grand Prix winning car. But what it did is when I tested that Williams in the 91 season, I actually went around Imola 2.2 seconds faster on race tyres in the Williams than what I had done in Brabham on qualifying tyres the weekend just gone. And then the penny dropped that, you know, I'd made a big decision and it was a bad one. And that then curtailed throughout the rest of the season in lack of performance. I did go on to score a point, the first point for Yamaha Motor Company and a, a world championship point for Brabham. But I came to the end of the season knowing that it wasn't going to be a place for me to stay and I wouldn't be able to blossom and flourish. So, again, I was approached by McLaren and I took the decision. I'd rather test for the team of McLaren's uh, performance levels and be a reserve driver for Ed and Senna and Gerhard Berger than be in a Formula One car with Brabham where I knew when I rolled down pit lane the chances of scoring any points was minimal and, you know, I wasn't going to be able to progress my career. So that was a big decision that I took. But I think actually for me at that stage, it was the right one. All right. So let's talk about the McLaren team a little bit, right? So when you were there, uh, Ron Dennis was there. Ayrton Senna was there. I mean, overall, it just has this certain aura to it, right? So, you know, as a young driver showing off to McLaren HQ, like what were kind of your, your first reactions to what was going on around you? Well, of course, I'd been racing against Senna and, uh, and, and Gerhard Berger in McLaren anyway when I was in Brabham and, <clears throat> and also been testing against them as well when I was testing at Williams. So I kind of knew the guys anyway, but for sure to go, you know, into, into McLaren at that period was a fantastic feeling. I'd been working at Williams, so I already knew what a great team was like to work with, but McLaren during that time with Senna at the wheel, you know, for sure were the powerhouse and the other great thing was also to get to test uh with honda power you know with a v12 honda i mean it still resonates with me to this day and in fact i was very lucky to see uh one of the cars that i tested go around goodwood last year uh and even stand there and listen to it being revved up you know at some nineteen thousand rpm it brought back a lot of memories but you know mclaren ron dennis the and senna Neil Oakley, uh, Henri Durand, um, lots of big names floating around there with big contributions. Martin Whitmarsh, you know, lots of people that contributed to my career and lots of people that, you know, I have a huge amount of respect for. But, you know, overall also to be part and parcel of a, of a team where, you know, Senna was driving. Uh, I had some great battles with him on a couple of occasions. Uh, and stood on the podium alongside him after the Red 92 as well. So, you know, good memories, good times. But it's um, it was a team that in, in some ways was quite cold, and it was cold from the outside. But on the inside, actually, it was a very warm feeling. And if you were part of McLaren, you knew exactly what you were there for. And without doubt, it was there to try and win because that was the only thing that they went racing for on Sunday afternoon. Yeah. Well, as you're saying, you got to spend a fair amount of time with Senna, you know, both as a competitor and then as a teammate, right? So, and I think while you're at McLaren, I, if I remember correctly, you guys actually shared a very similar car setup. So, based on all this experience, what, in your opinion, made Senna the superhuman driver? Well, I think actually Senna for me was was uh, an incredible racing driver, and by that I actually mean that racing driver on Sunday afternoon. If you had to put somebody on the back of the grid to go to the front my money would have been on Senna every day. Um, but he was also very special and unique in the way that he extracted the maximum from the people around him. And I would say over that 92 season, that was something I learned a huge amount from, watching him operate 
as a driver in and out of the car. Uh, he had this uh, special ability of, you know, just putting pressure into a system, whether that be with the performance of the car at McLaren, whether that be with the guys at Honda, and doing it in such a way where he got to get everybody working for him. For me, it was also quite nice that, yes, you're right, uh, Berger's setup was very different to the setup that Senna and myself would use. And in fact, our driving styles between myself and Senna were very, very similar. So I was very much of a guy who would um, pick up the throttle two or three times in a corner. And Senna was similar in the way that he picked the throttle up and manipulated it. And in doing so, we drove the car in the same way. We got the car to be very stable when you pick the throttle up, especially with a car that had a blown underwing, because a lot of performance came from that from the exhaust gases at the rear and then sucking the car down. And we would use the throttle to manipulate the direction of the car. Whereas Gerhard would be very much a guy that we would say would be on the nose. So he'd come into a corner very heavy, heavy braking, stick the car on the nose, pitch it in, and sort out the problem after. Our style was different. We'd use the rear to rotate. And then we'd basically blend the car off the corner with a lot of understeer, we'd push. And that would be the way that we drove it. So it was nice in a way because... I think Senna had confidence in what I was doing in the test role that when I was driving the car, our driving styles are similar. So he knew that it would be suitable for the way that he liked the car. Uh, you know, probably went against Gerhard in some ways because Gerhard's style was different and his setup had to be different. So advantageous for Ayrton at the time with me doing the test work. All right. Well, it's now time to take a break from the main conversation and head over to my new favorite segment, Off the Grid. Uh, for those who can't read into that poor play on words, this segment is essentially my chance to get to ask some unconventional questions that might occasionally be borderline moronic. And well, hopefully we learn something new about Mark in the process. All right. So my first question, Mark, are you tired of interviewers like me always asking you about the things that went wrong in your career? Uh, no, not really, because at the end of the day, I had a lot that went right. Um, so life's a little bit of a balance at all times. So if people want to talk about what went wrong and you can learn from it, fantastic, because every day is a school day. So, uh, yeah, I don't have a problem with that. All right. Okay, so in your time as a test driver, whenever you were faster than the actual Grand Prix drivers, how pissed were they usually? Um, yeah, they could get very pissed. I mean, actually, just talking about that, Senna got very pissed off with me one day when I uh, equaled his time in the active rice suspension car at, uh, at Imola when we were at McLaren, because, again, I did a lot of active work there, uh, to the point where he refused one of the McLaren personnel to take me to the airport because I was departing that day. It was kind of a little bit of a, uh, a psychological, you know, process from him to say, you know, you are the test guy and I'm the Grand Prix star. So, you know, I'll dictate what goes on here. And he did. They took note of it. So um, I had to find my own transportation to get to the airport. But, you know, that, that, that for me was just part of the makeup of what you had to absorb at that level. And, you know, I'd done my job and I'd done it well and uh, it had been noted. So that was that. But yeah, uh, pressure's always on. Grand Prix drivers, you know, like any elite sports people, um, to a degree, you're always going to have a little bit of someone looking over your shoulder. So that's part of the pressures. People usually assume that F1 drivers live a life filled with glamour and gold rim sunglasses. Was this the image that was sold to you as a young kid? And in your experience, did that image hold true in real life? I think everybody looks at certain people in certain walks of life and they have some aspirational aspect of it. Don't get me wrong. I think Grand Prix drivers very lucky, very fortunate, and we had a fantastic lifestyle. Uh, but, you know, a lot of that glam and glitz was exactly that. It was glam and glitz. A uh, long time on the road. Many occasions missing out on things. You know, I, I had a very young family, so <clears throat> I was already a father at uh, 21 years old, and I was still trying to make my Grand Prix career. So for me, looking back, I missed out on a huge amount of my first son growing up because I was on the road. You know, you're on the road for some nine months of the year. So you missed out a lot of that side. That's not glam, that's not glitz. That's just an unfortunate scenario, but you have to make the choice and you have to go do what you need to do. Where we are today, 
my Grand Prix career enabled me to do certain things for my children that I ordinarily wouldn't have been able to do. So, you know, that's the sacrifice you make. But I think the travel element of it is something that is a little bit, a little bit more mundane than people expect, you know, very much uh, arrive at the circuit, go to the hotel, go back to the airport, get back on a plane again, same routine, you know, might sound glam and glitz, but actually, uh, you know, gets a little bit, sort of old old habit and routine after a while. And I think that's part and parcel. Sometimes when people get burnt out, they get burnt out of that same routine. You know, that's interesting because I've spoken to quite a few, um, you know, race engineers and they, they kind of echo the same thing. You know, when you're in your early 20s, maybe traveling and going across the world is kind of a, it's, an, it's a nice thing, and then but it gets old very quickly. Um, so it's nice to see that holds up with drivers as well. <laughs> Um, thanks to social media and you know various Netflix series like to drive like Drive to Survive, which a uh, new season just came out, uh, we can now see drivers' personalities on full display. Um, which current F one driver do you find most similar to yourself? You know, both in terms of personality and maybe career. Uh, that's a good one. Um, I haven't watched Drive to Survive. I've not watched any of the series, so I don't have any insight into that. But Probably Daniel Ricciardo. Really, I say that, and because he's got he's got a good sense of humour, and you know he he has a good laugh, and he engages in in every aspect of the of the team. But at the same time, when he needs to go and get the job done, he does. Hmm. And that was probably you know if you talk to people, probably from the outside looking in. Many people would say, you know, I was you know, always cracking jokes or trying to keep things, you know, lighthearted because that's what I needed as an individual to sort of get on and do my job. And I think probably Daniel's made up in the same way. That's interesting. Well, like, because, I mean, again, this is a very broad brushstrokes thing, and I don't know yourself as well as you do. But I, kind of looking in, I thought that maybe Nico Hulkenberg might be a good one because I thought, you know, he's another driver that. Um, maybe, I mean, and of course his career is not completely done yet, but had one or two, you know, he doesn't have any podiums yet. Maybe one or two things changed that would be different right now. And if I'm remembering this correctly, he also did win at Le Mans, which I thought was maybe a nice similarity there. So, I mean, yeah. do, do, I mean, I, I mean, it's, it's, it's an interesting one. If I look back, <clears throat> I mean, you, I don't know if you've ever done it, but if you, if you look and see how many Grand Prix drivers have scored podium finishes it's not that many and when you look at it and you go right how many have scored two and then three you know the numbers start to reduce significantly and there's there's many grand prix drivers that you look on and you go like right what did they do and actually uh, many of them had never been on the podium so you know it, it's quite an interesting uh, point you look at a lot of careers and you, you go oh, they've been around but they've never been on the podium so you know i I still look from my side and I'm really happy that I managed to stand there on three occasions in cars that were not always fantastic. And also when I stood on the podiums, I stood against either world champions or world champions to be. So, you know, the, the, the quality and the caliber of the, the podiums I had are good memories for me because, uh, you know, I had some great guys I stood alongside. Yeah, well, those are all really valid points. And yeah, you're right. I didn't really consider maybe the weight that even one podium might have. I think actually, maybe maybe I'm remembering this wrong, but your friend Martin Brundle, I don't think he ever stood on a podium. Is that correct? Or No, he had some, he, Martin had some podiums. He um, okay. Yeah, he, he, had, he had several podiums. So he would be up there. But, you know, it's, you could even look today and look in today's Grand Prix grid and, and, you know, analyze it. I mean, it'd be an interesting one for you to look at, but... And then if you look over the last 10 years, 15 years, you know, the, you can do a spreadsheet. It's, it's, quite, it's quite an interesting thing. You know, several drivers' names that you will look at and actually, hmm, I never stood on a podium. It's, uh, it's quite a, a, a factual point to look at. Interesting. Well, that is the end of the Off the Grid segment. So time to go back to my main set of questions. Um, so up to this point in your career, you had raced with McLaren, you had tested for Williams, and which were two very good teams, right? And then you had raced with Brabham, one not so good team. So what were some differences that you noticed in the way that those two or those three teams ran? Um, I mean, at the end of the day, a lot of it's down to 
your engine manufacturer in terms of you know the provider there um you know the combination of installation between engine and chassis but 90 percent of the time it's about the people involved in the team you know it's no different to where we are today you know there's only one adrian newey yeah there's only one lewis hamilton there's you know so you know when you get these guys together uh, and create one of these powerhouse teams, you know, nine times out of 10 is a very strong performing package. And that's where you tend to see these cyclical performances from teams where, you know, they really go and hit home and they're at the top of the tree for several years. And sometimes a part of that makeup will fall away and all of a sudden, you know, the team and the team's performance starts to fall with it. So where we are now, there's a possibility that Mercedes may not be as strong as what they have been the last few seasons because it looks like there's a little chip in the armour there and it looks also like several of the other guys have caught up. So, you know, we're about to see some changes in terms of performance, but most of the time, a lot of it is down to, you know, that packaging of components and uh, a lot of the human input is actually quite instrumental in how the team performs. Well, you just gave any Formula One fan watching this interview, you gave them a lot of hope for this upcoming season, right? <laughs> All right. So after a year with McLaren testing, right, you went on to race with Tyrrell and Ligier. And as you said, earned three podiums with, you know, very esteemed drivers standing next to you. And then finally, in 1995, you ended up back at McLaren, this time as a Grand Prix driver. So after that 1995 season, why did you not continue in Formula One? Uh, actually, I was destined to continue in Formula One. So I didn't continue with McLaren because uh, some politics and also the fact that there was some other things at play where I wasn't going to be able to continue there. But again, from my performance there at McLaren, um, you know, we'd, we'd done a good job for them and uh, everybody uh, would, would sort of put their hands up and, and admit that was the case. <clears throat> we got... Uh, approached by Sauber and the Sauber team were uh, then with Ford engines and and I'd got to actually get to a, a heads of agreement with that side of things and, and looking to go to the Sauber team for the 96 season. In this sort of interim period, there was a guy that came along called uh, Matasic, who now is Mr. Red Bull and he became an investor in Sauber and the dynamics changed because as part of his investment, he made it known that he wanted to be choosing or having the right to the driver choice. And there was only one seat available and the choice was made that if the seat was going to get filled, it should get filled by a Grand Prix winner. And the only Grand Prix winner that was available at that time who didn't have a seat was Johnny Herbert because Johnny had won the British Grand Prix in 95. So basically they then went and employed Johnny, and I was told that I was no longer uh, required. And I got disheartened with Formula One. I just felt, you know what, I've, I've kind of had enough of this. Uh, <clears throat> but from my performance with McLaren Mercedes, Mercedes said, here's an IndyCar engine package that we will support you with if you wish to go to IndyCar. And that's exactly what I did. I took that to PacWest Racing, and uh, I couldn't use the engine program for the year that I joined them in 96, but 1997, we had Mercedes-Benz engines going forward from there on. So, I mean, I, obviously that Mercedes engine package that played a large uh, you know, part in your decision to move on the cart, but um, was was Le Mans not a factor at all, or, you know, you know, WEC or something like that? Because you won in 1992, right? So uh, I'm guessing there were probably a decent amount of offers had you, you know, decided to go that route. Yeah. I mean, there were other situations that I could have looked at in the world of sports cars, but uh, being honest with you, I was still really, you know, single seaters was, was my love. Uh, although I did love sports car racing and, and, you know, did my uh, early years before F1 doing that. And again, <clears throat> came into F1 slightly in an orthodox fashion uh, but also alongside people like Michael Schumacher, Frentzen, Wendlinger, all Formula One drivers that came via sports cars. So it was a great platform at that time. Uh, I kind of, you know, I've always been a little bit 
left of field and a bit different in the way that I've approached things, even going back to the early years, as I said, Formula 4 2000 and jumped straight to F3000. So I looked at IndyCar, you know, cart, and sort of said, well, why not? Why don't I try and uh, carve out a career there? And, and I, oval racing appealed. Um, <clears throat> nearly killed me early on, but uh, it appealed as a form of racing. So that's, that's where I went, you know. And as I say, I, I just got disheartened with F1. I was fed up with the politics, fed up with the, uh, the sort of, you know, the pick up and drop off sort of uh, routine of, of drivers. You know, you don't see that so much today. And that's what I'm saying to you. You know, things have changed. Um, you know, the, the change in driver happens very rarely. You know, so you'll see a driver with a team for five, six, seven seasons. You know, uh, that didn't happen back in my generation. Yeah, I mean, that's why this particular F1 offseason between 2020 and 2021 has been so interesting to watch, right? Because you don't really see, as you said, drivers just bouncing around like that all the time. Well, I want to take one more quick diversion, this time to ask some fan questions from my followers. So this first one is from at Apex Dream Cars, and he's asking, can you tell us the story about getting Martin Brundle's first class airline seat? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh... So it's very simple. If you look at Martin Brundle and Mark Blundell in Japanese, and you take the first letter M and in our surnames, they are spelt the same in Japanese characters. <laughs> uh, so basically I arrived at the airport, bearing in mind that I was the new boy on the block at Brabham when I was teammates with Martin, and Martin was the superstar. So he went everywhere first class travel, and I went everywhere in the back of the plane because, you know, I was the, the apprentice. So <clears throat> I arrived at the airport in, uh, in Tokyo, and we were going on to Australia for the, the last Grand Prix. And because I was in the back of the plane, I was there early to check in, as you need to be, and uh, got presented with this first-class seat. Um, and I thought, oh, you know, they, they've recognized me. I'm a Formula One driver, so they must have upgraded me. You know, how, how lovely. So I got on the plane and was very happy with myself that I was sitting in like number 2A or something. Uh, and much to my uh, sort of um, surprise, I saw a red-faced Martin Brundle, you know, who was my teammate at the time, so I know him very well, in the doorway of the plane, you know, looking at me, daggers and sort of acknowledging like, you need to move, you know, like, like this with his head, like... Anyway, the Japanese stewardess came and asked me if she could see my boarding pass, of which I showed her, and she compared it to the one that Martin had. And also I was being a little bit sort of uh, arrogant at the time and saying, you know, I'm not moving. This is my seat. I'm staying here. Because by this time, everybody in first class was all F1 people, and they kind of cottoned on and realized what had happened. So I had to go along with it. And I did nine hours in 2B, and I think Martin did – nine hours in 65F. So um, I won the day. He's never forgiven me for that either. And uh, and to be honest, I've never paid him for the difference in airfare. So there you go. Oh, so even as F1 drivers, you guys still had to pay for your own plane tickets? Yes. And, uh, and then as F1 drivers, we were highly competitive. So, you know, if I got the upper hand of him to sit in his first class seat, I was going to take it. That was a psychological barrier done. Yeah. Make sure that you get you get the better rest on the nine hours, right? And be ready for Australia. There you go. Yeah. All right. So, well, the second question is from Mouse Media and saying between an Indy, between an Indy car and an F1 car, which one is more difficult to drive? Uh, well, if you set an Indy car on an oval, then I would pretty much put uh, an Indy car on an oval as uh, being extremely difficult to drive because, you know, the nuances and the margins and tolerances are so small to get the car handling to your liking and to handle in the, uh, in the environment of all those other cars around you. I'd say that's probably as tough as it comes in driving a race car at, uh, at the finite edge. Um, <clears throat> in terms of the purest element and the performance edge, F1 car would be, you know, the ultimate in terms of its pure input and outputs. So, you know, in some ways they look similar and they do the same job in many ways, but the differences are quite noticeable. But, you know, I've, I've never been as quick as anything other than an Indy car, you know, 253 miles an hour uh, in a straight line on Fontana and 227 in a corner. 
And I think we did two miles in 29.9 seconds or something. So crazy speeds. But again, doing 220 odd or 226 miles an hour in a Formula One car at uh, Hockenheim or Monza was also a crazy experience as well. So um, horses for courses. Yeah, and well, you you would know something about ovals, right? Because I, if I believe, remembering correctly, it was Rio, right, in 1996 or something like. You had a really big crash there, right? On a tri oval, I had brake failure. Yeah, at 200 miles an hour, so I had 198 miles an hour impact into a concrete wall with no brakes. I, uh, I think the the thing I remember like really well is you're saying that you know after you realized that your brakes have failed, you tried to aim for the back of the car in front of you, which happened to be your teammate. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I actually aimed uh, down on the apron and went across the grass to try and hit him. So uh, that was done on purpose because I, I felt that if I was going to hit the concrete wall at that speed, the chances of me surviving and living were slim. So I thought if I could hit him at least and take some of the energy out, you know, I didn't, I didn't have any regard for my teammate, but uh, at that point, self-preservation kicked in. So that was the, the aim and the target at that point. Lucky for Maurizio, my teammate, I missed him uh you know probably by about an inch but yeah. uh yeah, lucky for him i missed him but you know we're still here to talk about it so that's that's a good thing yeah for sure yeah i just thought it's funny because you know obviously that that makes sense that you know survival instinct kicks in right but um i think whatever youtube video i'd happen to watch you saying that people immediately in the comment section were like did he really say that he was aiming for the back of his teammate and they they found that problematic so i thought i just thought that was funny <laughs> Yeah, yeah. No, I, I don't have any issue a bit in that. That was, uh, you know, it was, a, it was a spur of the moment and split second decision. Um, and I think anybody in their right mind that was sitting in a race car heading towards concrete at 200 miles an hour would have made the same decision. So, yeah, no problem whatsoever. Yeah, understandable for sure. All right. Well, thank you, as always, to everyone who submitted a question. I think that they were particularly good this time around. So on to my final two questions. Or actually, it's my final three questions. I, I added something last second. <laughs> um, as a driver from the good old days of F1, what do you think is currently wrong with the sport? And I realize that this is a, a loaded question, so feel free to be as general or specific as you'd like. Uh, no, for me, it's very easy. What's wrong with the sport is that it's no longer motor racing. It's motor like procession. You know, so modern day F1 isn't what I feel it should be. For me, I want to see modern day gladiators at combat in, you know, at the wheel of a Formula One car side by side. Today, I don't get to see that, unfortunately. I get to see, you know, strategic changes made that have an impact on the race result or something fabricated with DRS being involved where an overtaking maneuver is done, you know, in an artificial fashion. So, you can shoot me down for saying it, but that's what I feel. And as a purist, you know, I want to see cars. And I think for racing drivers, you know, that's what they're called, racing drivers, you know, mm -hmm. racing against each other, one-on-one uh, -on -one combat, you know, at the helm of uh, high technology machinery to try and achieve that. So, yeah, that's, that's the biggest issue for me. I, I wish F1 would be able to get to a point where, you know, I watch a Formula 2 race and I find that, has more racing involved than what an F1 race does. It shouldn't just be about pit stop strategy or tire strategy or anything else. It should be about racing cars going in side by side at 200 miles an hour and uh, seeing who comes out the other end. Yeah, I mean, that's something that's been reflected by so many people, but how exactly do you think people are, you know, people in Formula One should go about making those changes? Because the way I see it, there's kind of two sides or two ways that, you know, Formula One can lean because you know, you mentioned Formula 2, that's a mostly spec series, right? So, you know, you could argue that Formula 1 could start to move towards that a little bit. You know, cars are even, that leaves a little bit more room for drivers to fight with each other, right? But then there's also, you know, the, the other thing that part of the reason why, you know, big manufacturers like Mercedes or McLaren or, you know, anyone enters a sport is they want the ability to, to be able to innovate and, you know, do their own thing. They don't want to have to stick to spec, you know? So... I mean, in the 90s, it seems like a time where people were innovating and you guys still had good racing. So why is that still not happening today? Well, that just proves that it can be done because you had innovation and you had great amount of technology that was driven through uh, the platforms of various teams with the manufacturers then going on to use it in their cars several years later. But, you know, there's much more cleverer people than me that can work this stuff out. Um, 
<clears throat> but I think there's a balance. I think it's also a balance that the human input side should be there a little bit more. So, you know, sometimes back in our generation, human input would be an error that was caused by making a gear shift wrong. And you would capitalize on that and you would make an overtaking maneuver. You know, today, a failed gear shift would be recognized in, you know, 20 milliseconds and would be rectified and the gear shift would still happen in under a tenth of a second. And so nothing would happen on track to make the difference, you know, because there's a backup system and then there's another system if that fails. That's just technology that's overtaken the human input. And the fact that probably looking at maybe like an 80-20 split of driver contribution towards performance of the car. So, you know, I think that that needs to be readdressed and the balance of that taken slightly more towards a driver having more input and at that point having the chance to make mistakes. Um, yeah, there's, there's enough people around much smarter than me to work it out, but, you know, trust me, it can be done. Uh, if we can do endurance racing and do a six-hour race and people finish within a second of each other at the end of it, there's no reason why we can't do that over the Grand Prix distance of two hours max. Do you feel that maybe teams have been kind of boxed in? Because you, I, I know like one thing, what was it, like the active suspension system, right? That was huge in the 90s. And then, it, you know, the, a lot of that stuff, you know, the FIA wanted to hold back on that. And, you know, they, they, it kind of played a diminished role. So do you feel like now, I mean, I've actually, I've read some books, you know, f from former engineers in Formula One, where they think the 90s were like the height of technology in Formula One. And then after that, it's just not really changed all that much. So do you feel like teams should be allowed to do that sort of thing and, you know, keep advancing? Well, I think the problem is, is like, you know, you just touched on the subject where F1 is the pinnacle of technology and the cutting edge. What comes of that is cost, you know, a, a fiscal contribution and, and the costs keep going up and up and up and up. So again, it has to be addressed where, you know, are we there for a technology platform or are we there for entertainment on Sunday afternoon? And my problem is, in today's world especially, you know, I come from a generation of having three channels on TV. You know, you'll be in a generation where you've got a thousand channels as well as all your streaming channels and you're watching most things on a device. You know, that's what Formula One is up against. The goalposts have moved and the people's choice is so big now, you know, it's, you know, I'd be watching something on YouTube that I would never, ever in my lifetime felt that I was going to watch a guy, you know, being, you know, up the side of a mountain on a, on a, on a four wheel drive vehicle, you know, that uh, is, is extreme sport in a way, you know, it just didn't exist. But now I can watch that and it's entertaining. So if F1 don't do something where it's going to be entertaining for two hours, then people are not going to engage. And that's the problem. And that's the thing that I worry about as a purist that, you know, we're not getting to see. But I think that they know it's there and I think they're addressing it for the future. Yeah. And I mean, I guess you could argue with, you know, things like Netflix series Drive to Survive. They're trying to reach out more to people in my age bracket and try to rectify that problem. They, they are. We're showing you behind the scenes and showing you the inner makings of what goes on within F1 maybe. But that still doesn't change what you see and watch on track. Yeah, that's 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 very fair. All right, so we move on from that a little bit. I know I didn't. I definitely asked more questions than I intended to, but that's nice. I would really, I really liked hearing what you had to say about that sort of thing. Um, so, well, currently you run your driver management business, MB Partners, which you initially founded with Martin Brundle. Is this service that you provide only valuable to drivers like you who don't come from a motorsport background or don't have that sort of support? Or can it still be useful even for drivers who are part of, you know, big driving academies? Uh, listen, we, we run a management agency. Um, and for me, it's about career advancement, career guidance. So, you know, I've been in the shadows of a couple of drivers like Mike Conway and Gary Paffett, you know, current world champion and WEC, two-time DTM champion, Gary Paffett. You know, I've been with those guys, you know, supporting them. Uh, and in the background, because for me, management is like a bodyguard. You, you should only be seen when required. Um, and that's how I consider management to be. So, you know, I've been with them 17 years. So, you know, there's, there's lots of ups and downs in that relationship with, you know, on-track, off-track performances and the highs and lows of being a professional racing driver. 
But I, uh, I, I run MB Partners because I, I want to give something back in terms of my experiences to try and support young drivers. And hopefully they stay with us for the, you know, the period of time like Gary and Mike. But it doesn't mean to say if they're starting from entry-level karting. You know, we have a 12-year-old, Kanato Lee from Tokyo in Japan, who's with us. And, uh, you know, he's at the very beginning of his career. And I'm hopeful that he will be with us throughout his career. Uh, you know, and he has a very good career ahead of him. So for me, it's trying to iron out all of the pitfalls and smooth out the road. And if we can do that, then we're doing a good job. Doesn't mean to say that he won't learn by some of his own mistakes, because I also think that's a good thing. But, you know, motorsport is a world where um, it's sport and business combined. So you need to be on your toes and aware of what's going on around you. And if we can make sure we've got a good infrastructure to support our drivers, then so be it. So when I asked you earlier, are you, are you tired of people like me asking you about like your failures in your career? So not really, because you can use it right now. <laughs> I can use the good stuff and I can use the bad stuff. Yes. And if that's supportive to the guys that we have, then brilliant. And I can use the network that I've built up over the 30 years. And hopefully that network is with me being known that, you know, I'm a straightforward guy. And if I say something, I deliver on it. And if I can't do it, I won't do it. And I only want to be doing things that are on the best interests either for my drivers or the best interests of what I call triangulation. You know, there's us, there's the driver. There's the team and the manufacturer, and we all have to work together for each other. Well, I know the next driver that I, I interview, I'll definitely tell him to come meet you. <laughs> all right, so this is my last question. What's your favorite moment from your career? It could be as a businessman right now, or of course, in your driving past. Uh, you know, it, it's a question that people have asked me quite a lot over the last few years, but um, probably my favorite moment is actually my first year in, in motor racing. When I was a teenager, uh, undertaking Formula 4 1600, and everything was a new experience and a journey. Uh, little did I know that I would become a Grand Prix driver or go on to win Le Mans or go on to win IndyCar races. I had no understanding of that whatsoever. I didn't even think about it. So back then, starting off, the most enjoyable days because it meant nothing and at the same time it meant everything and it's when you get the pressures of being a professional that's when it starts to become more of a job and things change and the dynamics change so i go back to the very first year the most enjoyable time of my life yeah well that's certainly understandable and yeah thank you so much for answering all of my questions today it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the show and yeah thank you